Welcome to Lecture 5, the final lecture in Section A of this course. In the last part of Lecture 4, we started to look at rotational rheometry. We looked at two new tool types, parallel plates, where the shear rate in the gap was a function of radius, and a Conan plate, where the shear rate in the gap was constant. Both of these geometries are different from the Couet cell that we examined earlier in the course and give you more experience of dealing with different types of tool geometry and, in this lecture, different types of torque and force balance. What we're going to do in the first section of this lecture is to introduce a workflow that, in many ways, is very, very similar to the Rabinovich correction that we looked at for capillary rheometry. The motivation is exactly the same. We want to be able to characterise a fluid of unknown rheology. Therefore, we want to be able to take and subsequently process data that will give us material parameters with which we can then fit, for example, the Corot or the corot yasudar equation, one of the generalised Newtonian constitutive equations. So we are aiming to get parent viscosity as a function of shear rate as the primary data from this exercise. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to examine a force and torque balance on a pair of parallel plates. And then we will start to do an analysis that says we don't want to assume what the rheology is. We're going to derive a set of equations that we can use to process the type of experimental data that we get, which will result in apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate. So we'll finalise by looking at another practical application of this example, which will be the characterisation of a polyethylene melt at lower shear rate. So what we will do to start off with is introduce the geometry that we're looking at. So on the blackboard in front of you is a top view of a pair of parallel plates. And so they appear as just one circle because we're looking down on them. What I've highlighted in white there is an elemental periphery of fluid. And that's the periphery of fluid upon which we're going to do our torque and force balance. And so the torque will be measured by a spindle that, that is in the centre of the plate. And of course, torque is a force times a lever arm. So we need to look at this diagram and think, well, what are the forces acting on this plate? We can see that the primary force that we have is going to be tau in the z theta direction. Remember the face first convention. So this is the z face in the theta direction. So in the direction of the rotational flow, we're assuming that the bottom plate is rotating with a constant angular velocity. So that force, that stress tau z theta has to be multiplied up by an area, which is two pi r times delta r, which is the thickness of that white periphery. And that resultant force then acts at a lever arm of radius r from the centre of the disc. And so what we end up with is an expression for the torque on the top plate, whereby we integrate from the middle to the outside edge at radius r equals big R, the expression that we derived above. So there we have it. So gamma, our torque, is 2 pi r squared. The integral between 0 and big R, the edge of the plate, of tau z theta as a function of r dr. Now, if you think back to the capillary workflow, we said we're not going to substitute a constitutive equation for tau z theta because doing so would make an assumption of the rheological response of the fluid, which is what exactly what we do not want to do. Also, if you think back to the capillary workflow, we said what we can do is swap some variables around and then we can perform an integration whereby we still keep the unknown rheology within the assumption of the equation. So we're going to do the same here. Now, I'm reminding you of two quantities on the blackboard now. I'm reminding you of the expression for parallel plates for gamma dot z theta, because we're going to be relating that to tau in a second by a change of variables. And that is just simply r omega over h, where h is the gap between the bottom and the top plate, the gap in which the fluid sits. If we rearrange and differentiate that expression, we can see that dr is going to be h over w d gamma dot z theta. And remember that we said because our shear rate changes as a function of radius within the gap between the parallel plates, we need a datum for experimental purposes where we can say the shear rate in this experiment is 
and we refer the shear rate to the outer radius of the plate. So we've got the edge shear rate, gamma dot r, when little r equals big R. And so what we're going to do is to do a change of parameters. If we look at the integral that we arrived at from the torque expression, we're going to start by swapping r and dr with gamma dot z theta by rearranging the shear rate expressions on the board. And so what we end up with, if we look at the result that we've just put on the board, is that h over w, one of the h over w terms, comes from differentiating little r. So dr goes to d gamma dot z theta, and h over w drops out. The other two h over w terms, making up the cube, come from the r squared term, which we're now including inside the integral, which is where our gamma dot z theta squared term comes from. Tau z theta remains unchanged, which is good, and we have the 2 pi grouping outside the integral still. We've also changed the integration limits, and I've highlighted that in red. So we're going from 0 at the middle, where our shear rate is 0 in the middle, because effectively in the middle of the plate there is no angular velocity if you think about it. Gamma dot z theta is r omega over h, so when r equals 0, gamma dot z theta equals 0. To the shear rate at the outer rim of the plate, gamma dot r, which is of course when r equals big R by definition. So there on the board is the expression we've just arrived at. Now what we're going to do is do a little bit of rearrangement. If you recall the capillary analysis workflow, we rearrange this integral to get it into a form with which we could compare to the Leibniz rule, and we're going to do exactly the same again here. So we're going to manipulate this with a group of terms on the left-hand side of the equation. Remembering my edge shear rate gamma dot r is big R omega over h. So my h over omega term can be substituted into a grouping involving gamma dot r now and big R. So that's where that gamma dot r over r cubed term comes from on the left-hand side. The integral on the right-hand side now has been rewritten in a form we can directly compare to the Leibniz rule. So let's remind us what the Leibniz rule states. So there on the blackboard is the Leibniz rule. It's a differentiation of an integral equals a group of terms. And so if you compare what I've written in green, on the second line down we have our rearranged integral resulting from the torque expression. On the third line down we have the standard form of the Leibniz rule and we can see there is a comparability between the two. So the differentiation of that integral is going to be a squared f of a dA, which of course we can substitute in the result that the integral is equal to on that second line. So the group of terms involving gamma dot pi, gamma dot r, and big R. So there we've made that substitution. So d by d big R, because our equivalence is little a equals little r and big A equals big R, of the group of terms that was on the left hand side of the equation in the line above, gamma over 2 pi, gamma dot r over r cubed, is equal to the result from the Leibniz rule, which is that gamma dot r squared tau z theta. So there we have it. So we can rearrange this and we can use the chain rule. So if we use a chain rule now on that square bracket, we end up with the two terms at the top of the board. 3 gamma, gamma dot r squared over 2 pi big R cubed d gamma dot r. And then gamma dot r cubed over 2 pi big R cubed d gamma. So just using the chain rule on the inside or contents of the square bracket shown in white there. And the sum of those two terms is equal to gamma dot r squared tau z theta. Perfect. So not much to do now. We just do a little bit of rearrangement because what we want to do is to find the apparent viscosity and the intermediate step to allowing us to do that is to get an expression for tau z theta. So rearranging for tau z theta, we get the expression highlighted in blue on the board. So we have 1 over 2 pi r cubed, so that's geometric information involving the radius of the parallel plates. The terms I've highlighted in red within the parentheses, gamma dot r, is the edge shear rate. That is what we set in the rotational rheometer, and I've reminded you in the white brackets that gamma dot r is equal to r omega over h, so we're setting angular velocity, and by virtue of setting angular velocity we're setting the edge shear rate, that's why I've highlighted those terms in red. In the rotational rheometer we're measuring torque, which is the terms that I've highlighted in blue. So we can relate our shear stress, 
in the z direction on the z face in the theta direction to geometric terms basically radius and a grouping of terms which we either set or measure in our rheometer now remember once we've got our shear stress tau z theta in this case we can say well look our apparent viscosity is tau over gamma dot and that is applicable to any fluid and if we think of the derivation we've just done this is really very very similar to the Rabinovich correction so if you remember the workflow for either one or the other of these it will give you a very very good way of remembering what the remaining one is as well so hopefully that's a very useful piece of information let's apply this result now to some experimental data so on the blackboard in front of you I have plotted a graph which is torque as a function of shear rate for the same polyethylene the NG5056G that we looked at in capillary rheometry note also the temperature is also very similar it was 158 degrees for capillary rheometry and it's 160 degrees here and given the temperature accuracy of a standard thermocouple, which is what the temperature measuring device is in both of those cases, then we can say, well, that two degrees C may well be lost in the error of the temperature measurement. So we've got identical conditions temperature wise. I'm using 25 millimeter diameter parallel plates and the solid sample initially at room temperature had been cast into a sheet, a 25 millimeter disc punched out of that sheet put between parallel plates, the parallel plates put in the rheometer's oven, the sample melted, and then the experiment which was involving steady shear, i.e. a constant angular velocity on the bottom plate to set the shear rate, was then performed with torque measurements being taken. Now if we look at the shape and form of the experimental data in that graph, we can see that there are a number of regimes going from the lowest shear rate, 0.1 reciprocal second, through to three or four reciprocal seconds, we have an increasing torque as a function of increasing shear rate. Then we have something strange happening. We have a turning point. And with increasing shear rate, torque diminishes between about four reciprocal second and 10 reciprocal second. After 10 reciprocal second, once again, the torque increases with increasing shear rate, but in a faster way than it did initially. So the first thing you've got to do with experimental data is look at it very critically. Some of this experimental data on the board is valid and some of it is not. Now remember what we have are two parallel plates. The bottom plate is spinning at ever increasing speeds in, which correspond to increasing shear rates and at some point the centripetal force on the sample is going to cause the sample to leave the parallel plate geometry and in this case spray itself all over the interior of the rheometer oven which is a nice mess to clean out and so that is happening above about two reciprocal second where we have that point of inflection followed by a turning point in the experimental data that is a classic cue to think well have I still got all the material in my rotational rheometer and careful visual analysis i.e. looking at this experiment you can see quite clearly that above about two reciprocal second, the polymer sample is in fact leaving the plates. And so we have to get rid of all the data above two reciprocal second, which leaves us actually a very low shear rate range. We've got 0.1 to just above one reciprocal seconds worth of data here. But if we look at the torque curve for that data, we can fit a nice expression to those experimental data and as with the capillary data I fitted an analytical best fit curve to those data because I'm going to be differentiating torque as a function of shear rate and rather than numerically differentiate the experimental data which will give a bit of variation if I've got a good best fit curve that is analytical I can simply differentiate that analytical expression instead. So shear rate don't forget in this geometry is related to the angular velocity of the plate via r gamma dot over h. Don't forget that. Let's look now at how we do the first step of the analysis. Remember the derivation that we looked at gave us shear stress as a function of shear rate and that is now what is planted 
plotted on this graph. So we have shear stress on the y-axis as a function of shear rate on the x-axis. I've put on the graph now a reminder where that shear rate expression comes from. It's the result of that Leibniz rule derivation that we just looked at. And we can then convert this to apparent viscosity data, knowing that apparent viscosity is my shear stress over my shear rate. My shear rate datum is the edge shear rate. Remember, this gives us an average shear rate for the device. And there we have a flow curve for my low shear rate Newtonian plateau, which is exactly what we see. We see that there's very little variation of apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate at these low shear rates. So this hopefully underlines a point I made last lecture, which was that a given rheometer will give useful experimental data over a range of shear rates, which may not be the full range of shear rates that you want for your material characterization. So it is very usual to combine data from experiments performed on different rheometers to get a full rheological characterization. So in this case, we would combine the data that we've just arrived at with the data that we obtained in the last lecture with the capillary rheometer. And that would give us both the low shear rate and the high shear rate behavior. So let's recap a few key points. We looked at how to get shear stress and consequently apparent viscosity as a function of edge shear rate for a pair of parallel plates in a rotational rheometer. And we saw the analysis and the workflow is very, very similar to that for the Rabinovich correction. The result, of course, is valid for a fluid of any arbitrary rheology, because we have made no assumption what the fluid rheology is in the analysis. We saw that for parallel plates, we need to define a datum point to which to reference our shear rate against, and it's the edge of the parallel plate. So gamma dot r is our reference shear rate, our edge shear rate. We looked at some experimental data and we saw that actually you've got to be careful when you take experimental data because there will be data that is valid and there will be data that is not valid. And in this case, rotational rheometers pr can produce invalid data due to their propensity to eject a sample in parallel plates at higher rotational speeds. Once again, we talked a little bit about the data analysis, which was to say that once you've identified the valid data region, Fitting a good accuracy analytical expression to those data can be very useful when you're then differentiating the um, data that you've obtained. It's easier to differentiate the analytical expression than to differentiate the numerical data. Numerical differentiation is straightforward, but however, you will get a very rough data set if you do that.